Ähm, so, wir gehen, wir setzen unser, unsere Veranstaltung fort und eine wichtige Ansage, die ausnahmsweise nichts mit TTIP zu tun hat. Eine Dame hat eine Damentasche verloren. Wer diese Dame, wenn, wenn diese Dame mich jetzt hört, bitte keine Panik, äh, die Tasche ist in Sicherheit. Ja? Äh, da ist sie, also in der Ecke, wenn Sie sich umdrehen, dann sehen Sie, ich hoffe, dass das tatsächlich Ihre Handtasche ist. Ähm, wunderbar. So. Dann haben wir zumindest ein Happy End heute bei der Konferenz. Wir arbeiten jetzt am anderen Ende. Und wir haben eingeladen zu diesem letzten, sagen, ver verlängerten Panel. Wir wollen anfangen mit einem Thema und dann so ein bisschen alle Themen, die vorher angesprochen worden sind, alle Panels ein einbinden am Schluss. Also nochmal zum Tagesablauf. Es wird nicht nochmal zwei Panels geben, sondern ein Panel mit sozusagen einem offenen äh, Format am Ende. Ähm, wir haben jetzt sehr viel, abgesehen vom Anfang, technische Sachen angeschnitten. Sachen, wo es wirklich um Design von einem möglichen Abkommen geht, um die Risiken, die konkret mit diesen Fragen Handelsbarrieren äh, oder Datentransfer oder ISDS geht. Und jetzt vielleicht einen Schritt zurück. Wir verhandeln ja nicht im luftleeren Raum. Wir verhandeln in einer Welt, die komplex ist und immer komplexer wird. In einer Welt, wo die, einerseits das Wettbewerb zwischen verschiedenen Wirtschaftsräumen, andererseits auch politische Krisen sich multiplizieren, immer mehr werden. Und in dieser komplexen Welt, in diesem komplexen Kontext haben sich eben die zwei bestehenden großen Wirtschaftsräume vorgenommen, sich auf etwas zu einigen. Und die Frage ist, abseits von, ich will jetzt nicht sagen Chlorhühnchen, aber abseits von berechtigten Fragen wie Vorsorge, Prinzip haben wir angesprochen im Workshop oder Chilling-Effekt von einem möglichen ISDS. Abseits dieser Fragen, aber ohne diese Fragen auszublenden, was ist die Bedeutung dieses möglichen Abkommens, dieser möglichen gemeinsamen Ausgestaltung für die Welt und für die beiden äh, Kontinente? Das wollen wir besprechen. Gibt es jetzt so ein West, The West 2.0? Ja? Also ein neuer, neuer Begriff des Westens. Ist TTIP die richtige Antwort auf äh, die Herausforderung der Globalisierung? Dafür haben wir sehr spannende, hochkarätige Gäste hier versammelt. Und wir fangen gleich mit Elena Bryan, die äh, ähm, Oberrepräsentantin für Handelsfragen bei US Mission to the European Union ist. Also das Gesicht, das Sprachrohr äh, ähm, des Weißen Hauses hier in Brüssel. Ähm, und die Frage geht an Sie, ähm, jetzt abseits des ökonomischen Wachstums, das haben wir ja schon angesprochen, was sind die strategischen Vorteile, eines solchen großen gemeinsamen Marktes oder wie auch immer man das nennen mag, was dann kommt, ähm, für die Welt und für die beiden Kontinente. Und sind diese strategischen Vorteile größer als die Nachteile, die aus dieser Diskussion alleine schon für uns beide, für die beiden Seiten erwachsen? Thank you. <clears throat> I've never been called the mouthpiece of the White House before. <laughs> I've been called other things, but, um, <clears throat> and pardon me, I'm losing my voice a little bit, so. Um, it's been interesting to listen to the discussion today, and, and at many junctures I thought, 
I'm not sure I'm hearing a discussion about what we're actually negotiating. So let me give you um, a couple of minutes on what we're doing. You know, we do have the biggest trading relationship in the world. Um, every day, two billion euro worth of goods and services cross the water. Trade is a vital part of the American economy, just as it's a vital part of the German economy and also the, the European economy. Um, I've had the privilege of being out, I'm up to 24 member states now. And I always, because I live in Brussels and I live in the bubble, I always have to remember that when I leave Brussels, even if I'm leaving European Brussels and going to Belgium, that the EU is not a country. The EU is a, an international institution of a particular character. Um, and the member states are the sovereign countries that are behind the EU. Um, so if I slip, please, no offense. Um, we, neither of us are new to trade and investment agreements. And when I say neither of us, I mean the EU, the US on both, the EU on trade agreements, and Germany to investment agreements because before the Lisbon Treaty, member states negotiated investment agreements. It's only now post-Lisbon that the EU has investment competence. Um, there's, we had a discussion about ISDS in the next room and there was a lot of reference to CETA, the Canadian agreement, but you know the EU's negotiated a second one, Singapore, another developed country. Um, Three years ago, our leaders, in this case the EU leaders and the US leaders, the old EU leaders, Barroso and Van Rompuy, who's still around, met with President Obama and decided that we needed to take a fresh look at ways to enhance our trade and investment relationship between the two transatlantic blocs. Not a new idea, one that we've discussed in the past, but 15 years ago, we didn't think the conditions to, to come up with the kind of agreement that both sides would want were there. Um, the world has changed a lot. New players in the system, players that challenge us to be more competitive and efficient. Um, you know, we've had uh, rough economies on both sides of the water. Some of your fellow EU member states have had a much rougher ride than you have. Um, you know, when you go to places that have 50% youth unemployment, it's really serious. Um, but we both wanted to have growth and jobs. Um, but we also, I think, recognize that we're too long, we're two big blocks that have high standards and, and high values. Not necessarily identical, um, but, but we value things on both sides of the water and we have long associations. So they challenge the ministers Leaders challenged the ministers to figure out what we could do. We did it in this thing called the High Level Working Group on Jobs and Growth. Um, that was one of our first cultural experiences because we needed to agree on a name. The EU wanted to call it a reflection. And we said, ah, no one would understand that in the US. So we had to come up with this funky name. Um, and we looked at what would work for both sides. At the at the end of this process, we produced a report that had objectives and recommendations in it. And this is what we presented to the leaders and it was what um, kind of uh, pr prompted them to say we should negotiate an agreement. So what we agreed was a comprehensive, high standard rules-based agreement that would bring benefits and opportunities to both sides it could be politically supported on both sides. It was very clear from the beginning that this is the only kind of agreement that would work. This is really the first agreement of any size where the two parties across the table are equally matched. Each of us has a whole bunch of agreements. We have 14 agreements with 24 countries. The EU has something like 40 trade agreements. Um, and without exception, we've all negotiated with smaller countries. So this is the first time where it's really two big guys negotiating together. 
it was very clear from the beginning that um, because we each had highly developed legal and regulatory systems, um, the uh, US was not gonna become the 29th member state and the EU was not gonna become the 51st US subfederal state. So we need to find a way to construct an agreement that works for both of us, that brings the benefits and opportunities that we both want, but respects the systems on each side of the water. Um, it means it'll look different. We're not gonna be prescriptive to each other because we can't, nor do we want to. It also means that we're not creating a common market. Um, common market is scary to a lot of people. I think what I found in the EU is that people remember, you know, you were going to form this single market and oh my God, all these awful things were going to happen. They didn't. But it was, a it was a growing experience. It was a learning experience. You know, the single market still is not complete today. So we're looking at how we can make our systems work better together without one replacing the other. Tariffs, non-tariff barriers. Um, we have... Uh, we have a lot of trade between us. Hopefully we'll get rid of the tariffs, we'll reduce the NTBs. We wanna have a rules-based high standard investment relationship between us, between the EU and the US. Um, you just had a session where you talked about regulatory space. Um, we both regulate substantially. I've had people in Brussels say, well you in America, it's like the Wild West, you don't regulate anything. I think, well, that's interesting. I had three congressmen the week before who said, in 10 years, we had 39,000 regulations. That's over-regulation. It's as important to us in our Congress to regulate in the public interest as it is to you in Europe, without exception. Without exception. I've had people in Bavaria tell me that TTIP is gonna cause the municipal utilities to be privatized. And I said, well, that's really interesting because we have municipal utilities in the United States too. Most water systems and sewer systems are locally owned. We're not interested in having anyone tell us to privatize them any more than we would tell you. Second response, uh, we don't necessarily trust Brussels. Okay, well, sorry, I can't do that. I can't. Um, you you know, do it, don't you? What? Trust Brussels. Of course. <laughs> it's um, especially when the Belgians screw up the traffic so it's hard to get to the airport in the morning, Reinhard. Um, you know, we have, on the regulatory side, I've heard all kind of um, supposition of what we've been doing, but I think we've been pretty clear about what we're doing. We're talking about things like, do you have enough transparency in your system of making rules? In the United States, we have a very public rulemaking system. If a regulator wants to make a regulation, they have to publish it for the entire world to see. And they have to take comments from everyone. And before the rule's finalized, that regulator has to account for what they did with the comments. This is a very important system for us because it allows people that could be impacted by a regulation to see it to have the right to see it, and to have the right to comment on it, and to have its, um, its, the comments be accounted for. You know, I'm a trade negotiator, I'm not a regulator. I know regulators always think their way is the best way. Um, but having the input, you know, I, I, I was uh, talking at a conference some months ago, and I was talking about unnecessary divergences in regulations. We often regulate to the same end, but we get there differently. And sometimes we've gotten there differently because our regulators didn't talk to each other in the process. And this person said to me, well, what if a, an unnecessary divergence for a business is a key protection for a consumer? And I said, that's why we have a public process so that you have an opportunity to make sure the regulator knows that this is really important. So we'd like the, the commission to have more, more um, transparency in its process. Not to duplicate ours, but fi to find a way to do that. 
Um, you know, we're talking about things that are very practical. We're talking about some sectoral issues. We're talking about pharmaceuticals. You know, right now, our pharmaceutical regulator inspects American plants and European plants. And the EU regulator does the same. So for plants with a good record, do we each have to inspect the other's plants, or can we rely on the inspections of the local regulator? Interesting question. For, com for, for companies that have a good record, that might be a practical approach to how do you deal with risk in the world and uh, decreasing government budgets. We're looking at very practical things. Um, and you know, we have to publish whatever we do. We don't make rules, regulatory rules in a trade agreement. We, do it, we have to do it through our public process. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, you know, we're also then talking about another area, which is uh, issues where we have common challenges in a lot of places of the world. Um, and, and we'd like to work together better to, to address those. I think Dan Hamilton mentioned earlier one example, which was on toy safety. You know, at the end of the day, the point is that the, t the, the toys are safe for the kids, whether they're European kids or they're American kids. And if we can work together better to make sure that happens, that's all to the good. Um, you know, our, our uh, airline regulators got together a few years ago and decided that instead of the European authority having to certify every single airplane in its airspace, and the Americans had to do the same, that America now um, <coughs> acknowledges or recognizes the safety certifications that the EU does on Airbus planes, and Europe recognizes the FAA certifications of Boeing planes. Everybody wants the planes to be safe, so they figured out how to do it together. That's a good thing. Um, you know, there's a myth out there that this is all about big business. To the negotiators, this is as much about small guys. 95% of the businesses in the United States are small and medium-sized enterprises. They're the local guy across the street who supplies something, to, who supplies somebody else who exports. Um, often a barrier to entry that a big guy can overcome in a second market is a huge, expensive, insurmountable problem for a small guy. Why can't we use this agreement to reduce where possible some of those really significant market access barriers? Um, you know, these are, these are pretty basic questions, but I think it all goes back at the end of the day that we have democratic processes on both sides of the water and everyone values the right to regulate appropriately in the public interest. We just want to make the systems work a bit better together. Um, <clears throat> I gave Sergey a hard time about the common market, but you know, I also heard somebody say an economic NATO. That always makes me cringe a little bit, but, and I'll tell you why, because it was pointed out to me at some point they said, well, if it's an economic NATO, then who's the enemy? Because NATO grew up as a conglomeration of people against an enemy. And, you know, we all live in the, the world of globalization. We all do. Our companies function in globalization. We have global value chains. This is not about creating a fortress. It's about creating a system that works better together. And I'll make one last point, and then I'll shut up. You know... Um, my job before, I'm, I'm, I've been in trade a long time. And about now 10 years ago, I was working on Asia, which was terrific, but I decided I needed to change. So I did five years on trade and development, the intersection between trade and development, because we had lots of uh, developing country partners who said to us, we'd like to take advantage of the trade agreements, but we need some help. So my job was to kind of mix the development agency, the trade agencies, and figure out how to help. And one of the things that I heard frequently 
was that a huge barrier to entry for many developing countries, particularly African developing countries, was that they wanted to ship to our market and they wanted to ship to the EU market, which was often easier than shipping to their neighbors. But because in many cases our standards were enough different that it was a real barrier to entry and they had to choose. So I'm convinced that if we can make some of our regulatory systems work better together, that will uh, help a lot of developing countries not have to make the choice about whether they trade with us or they trade with you. Um, I haven't heard, heard that reflected in a study anywhere, but, but that's the evidence that I have. Um, thank you for um, your attention. Thanks a lot. This was uh, quite a statement. <laughs> and um, it, I must admit, it sounded very comforting. And the question to Reinhard Budikofer, who is not only a, a member of the European Parliament, he's also vice president of the Green European Party. So someone who deals with also the opponents of the Treat, a treaty on a basically daily basis, what's the buzz about? I mean, if this is what Elena told us, it sounded actually quite okay. So why, why are the emotions so high? Why is the whole discussion so uh, uh, escalating here in, 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 in Germany? This is number one. And number two, the question, uh, what Elena also mentioned, this is not a NATO, it's not about <coughs> someone else, but at the same time, we do want to set standards vis-a-vis -vis others. And so maybe this is not uh, a fork about creating a fortress, but is it about creative, creating a new kind of imperial power, the West, which will impose the standards on others just because they are of their mere power and uh, share in the economy? Thank you, first of all, for having me. Dan Hamilton told me that he, uh, he quoted uh, in his opening remarks one um, description that I, I have tried to employ in identifying what we're talking about when we talk about TTIP. And I think we're indeed talking about different agendas that to some degree do overlap, but also have some inherent contradictions. And one agenda I would call the common sense agenda. And some of the examples that uh, Elena has uh, displayed comfortingly are part of that common sense agenda, like the toy issue or the, the Boeing uh, issue and, and that kind of stuff. And I've rarely met anybody who made strong arguments against that, because that's just sort of kind of convincing. And then there's a second agenda that I would call the corporate lobbyist Christmas tree agenda, where all the pipe dreams that have bothered us for the last 15, 20 years are all of a sudden being burdened on the TTIP process. And yes, we need ISDS, and yes, we need whatever. I don't know, GMO and so on. I don't want to go into that. But this has hijacked the public discussion over TTIP. This is what's at the forefront. This is what people get excited about. And I've quoted this several times, and I will do it again. Um, Stuart Eisenstadt, many in the room know Stuart Eisenstadt. He's recently been working uh, for the Transatlantic Business uh, uh, Council. And he, ha he has been quoted in German public TV as saying, well, European standards are high, they're too high, and what is good food for an American family should be good food for a European family too. And if you hear such a statement, then you immediately understand what, why people get angry and why be, people get excited. Because they believe that the standards that they have come to be acquainted to 
are sort of representing their values. These standards are not just technical stuff. The standards about GMO, you can look at this from different angles, but the fact that these are European standards, that's expressing a certain decision for some values. High environmental protection, high social inclusion, and so on and so on. Don't want to go to details. And uh, Bush 41, George Herbert Walker Bush, has famously once said that uh, the American way of life is non-negotiable. And I think what people are expressing when they oppose this kind of conversation and this kind of a corporate agenda, they're saying the European way of life is non-negotiable. We want to adhere to the standards and we want to adhere to democratic processes. And if we feel that ISDS is undercutting that, we're opposed. So this is why it's becoming so emotional, because it's a value thing. And then there's a third agenda, and I would rather sort of focus the conversation on that, because that's usually getting lost, at least on this side of the Atlantic. We don't talk that much about the geostrategic agenda. And I believe we should. Uh, uh, Mrs. Merkel just did that. Um, uh, returning from the G20, saying that um, we have to hurry up. We have to put more pressure behind uh, the TTIP negotiations because the world is changing fast and we, we have to come to an agreement and, and to, to find common ground with the Americans. And I, I'm certainly not going to say this is uh, completely... Uh, out of the world. I, I mean, there are so many developments that are indeed ask, uh, giving us good reason to ask questions about how the international governance regimes and the international trade regimes should be 10 or 20 years from now, that I think it makes sense to also talk about trade in a strategic way. Um, I don't think this is just um, per se, as you asked, kind of neo-imperialist or neo-colonialist. I've talked to many of, of my friends from the environmental community in the United States, uh, and they would say, look, if we can come together defending some good environmental standards against what the Chinese or what the, the uh, Indians would support, we're, we're in favor of that. And they are very critical of T, uh, TPP, not TTIP. They're not so critical of TTIP be, uh, uh, because they don't, they don't really fear that Europe will undermine American standards. But they're very critical of TPP because they're afraid that their standards that they think are better at least than in, in some other regions in the world could be undermined by TPP. So I think this is not altogether an invalid point. But then the question is, how do we go about this? And there I see this geopolitical dimension sort of splitting in different directions. And one is what I would call the West against the rest. And uh, former Commissioner de Gucht, who is not one of the most differentiated thinkers on trade uh, has been quoted, for instance, in the US media as saying, look, this is about China. We have to gang up on China. That's not exactly his words, but that was his message. So if, if this is about locking in Western dominance in the trade arena for the next 30, 50 years, I think first of all, the question really is, is that gonna be our approach to the rest of the world, but even more so from a real politique point of view, I would say, is that at all realistic? If you look at what just happened at the APEC summit, what the Chinese did there, are we really fooling ourselves and really believing that we have a chance of sort of dictating to the rest of the world what trade standards will be? 
I don't think we, we will be able to do that. So it's not about lacking in dominance. I think that's completely misguided. It could be about showing some positive, inclusive leadership. Then we have to talk about the positive and the inclusive. And it's about adaptation to change. And uh, positive, I would, for instance, say, OK, is this trade agreement helping to facilitate a faster transition towards low carbon economies? That would be a great change. That would be a, a very positive thing. I don't see it yet. And a lot of stuff that has been put on the table in that regard has not been taken up by the negotiators. Then is it going in the direction of integrating rising powers in an international trade world? Not really. I mean, we have to concede that WTO has got stuck. But are we using the, the bilateral thing here to get it going? Or are we just supplanting WTO by regional and bilateral uh, FTAs? I would be rather in favor of using whatever leverage we have to unfreeze what has been frozen in the context of WTO and still persevere with a perspective of a plurilateral, multilateral trade uh, 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 arrangement in the world. And finally, about governance. Are we helping to create better global governance? And here I believe that uh, we, should be, we should be more more inclusive, and we should not pursue rules that are clearly undermining a level playing field. And uh, Elena just said, well, this is about the little guy. I would say, look, the common sense agenda, you might be able to convince me that this is about the little guy, but what about ISDS? On average, every party that's been uh, litigating has spent four million per case. How many little guys are there that would be able to afford that? And interestingly, the little guy is now beginning to speak up. This last week, for the first time ever, a business organization, the Bundesvereinigung um, Mittelständische Wirtschaft, Mr. Ohoven, have come forward saying, we do not agree with BDI, BDA, and other business organizations on ISDS. We object to that. So clearly, I think there are different perspectives. And if we want to um, discuss the geopolitical dimension, and I think this is relevant, we should not ignore that, then we have to discuss in which way are we going, and we have to discuss how can we prevent that this ambition is going to be hijacked by a corporate lobby agenda that is putting everybody else under their heel. Thank you. Let's, let's make another step away from, um, from kind of the hardcore to the technicalities and uh, go a little bit into history. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Maya Rostowska from Polish Institute of International Affairs um, the beginnings of the, or Elena can correct me as well, at the beginning TTIP was seen as a kind of a way of substituting something which was not perceived as relevant anymore. So I think this, uh, this talk about the um, economic NATO is not just there for no reason. It's because uh, a couple of years ago, uh, NATO was not perceived as an institution that we needed, an institution where we really could work with. OSCE was really not there except for observing some elections. And TTIP was a project to revitalize and revive the transatlantic relationship. So now we're in a different century politically. We have a Ukraine crisis. 
everyone, and you know in Poland especially, knows what NATO is for. Uh, we see OSCE and the merits of this organization going into the field and at least trying to make a difference. So maybe this idea of TTIP is indeed an idea of a different political century. Maybe the paradigm has changed with this Ukraine crisis and we should, as Nick said, invest more into developing more security and energy cooperation rather than wasting our political capital on negotiating TTIP. What is your view from Warsaw? Um, first, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been fantastically enlightening. Um, it's not like any TTIP discussion I've been to in I've been to a couple. Um, before coming, I had a long think about what I could contribute to the discussion. There's a lot of eminent speakers here, and as I expected, everything's been you know, really enlightening and fascinating. What I think I can give you is, as you say, the view from Warsaw, um, where just five hours train ride away, the debate looks very different, as you might expect. The stories that we tell um, are very different in Poland than what I've heard here today. Um, I don't know if any of you had had a chance to read Anne Applebaum's piece in Slate recently where she talked about coming to Berlin last week for the celebration. She was on our panel and oh, I was so, moderating. So, oh, yeah. so this is the panel because she talks about coming to um, Berlin and taking part in a panel on transatlantic relations, which I've now found out is your one. Um, and she basically, I really recommend reading it because it epitomizes the Polish view. <laughs> she talks about how... She was in shock that everyone is talking to... Like, basically, the, her attitude is, who cares about chlorinated chicken when we have Putin knocking on the door? And that, in a nutshell, basically, is, is the debate in Poland, is the story we're telling in Poland. Um, and that's a direct result of the security situation you described um, in our eastern neighbourhood, and I'm delighted you brought it up. Um, the view of TTIP has changed over the last year in Poland, but now it's definitely perceived above all as a geopolitical agreement. It's above all a tool for improving our security, our hard security, our military security, and our energy security. So I know Dan Hamilton and Elena don't like this term, but our president used it in Washington. It's an economic NATO, and that's how it's perceived in Warsaw. Um, so, in, with regards to the, the institutions you talked about, the OSCE and NATO, uh, there's no conception really in Warsaw or in Poland in the Polish debate about TTIP of it being an either-or situation. Um, if anything, TTIP is a tool for getting to the goals that the OSCE and, and NATO have. So, for example, in terms of security, uh, TTIP will increase American investment in Europe, and thus the Americans will be more invested in Europe. They will literally have more vested interests in our security. That's the thinking. Um, in terms of energy, I think Christine talked about it this morning, but um, it's about increasing. So the Poles obviously want an energy chapter uh, in TTIP. And the thinking is, it's not sort of this naive expectation that we'll sign it and in January 2016 there'll be sort of containers full of American shale oil and gas coming into Gdańsk Harbour. That's not the thinking. The thinking is it'll give us a better negotiating position with Russia, the fact that we have this potential extra supplier. Um, and I would just, as a aside, note that we have a new president of the EU Council, um, and he, uh, for his, his pet project is EU uh, sort of energy, the energy union. So energy security is important. So I would keep an eye out on that. Um, so basically, just to finish up, those issues that you mentioned, energy and security, are more important than increasing our GDP by 0.5% by whenever it is. But in Poland, the story is that, that's, that TTIP is consistent with those goals. So that's what I'm That's precisely what we're talking about here. Not about, it's not about increasing GDP for many uh, members of the European Union or maybe uh, some people in the United States. It's about investing, in, investing into each other, making kind of basically building a new Western alliance with different means. 
an interesting idea, but can you build a new Western alliance if you have a, a, a deficit of mutual trust and confidence as we have? It's not just the Ukraine crisis, it's the NSA that happened after or approximately at the time when TTIP negotiations started. Is it uh, possible at all to uh, talk about um, relying on each other if you are um, suspicious of spying on each other? Um, Daniela Schwarzer from German Marshall Fund of the United States. From this perspective, is TTIP is, uh, maybe the right project at the wrong point of time? Thank you, Sergei. Um, well, you, you talked about trust, and, and I think I will just start by quoting uh, a few figures um, to get us into you know, the picture. Um, first of all, I guess the trust debate is a very German piece of the European TTIP debate, which is not shared in the same way in a number of other member states, and which is not entirely understood on the US side of the Atlantic. So I think we are particular, which doesn't mean I want to do away with our issues, but we have to make them understood still. So if you look at the development of the way Germans trust uh, in the US, um, in 2009, those are the, the oldest figures I could found, find, and this is infra, infra test steam up, uh, trust levels were at 78%. So Germans asked, would say to 78%, we trust the Americans. Uh, the trust in France at the time was 87%. Us this summer, so after a number of months debating NSA and after the disclosure of the um, cell phone spying, uh, trust in the US and Germany was down to 35%. So that's an extreme low. Uh, trust in France, despite everything bad we are saying about France all the time, is still at 80%. So you see that there is a decoupling, really, between the US um, and Germany and when I see the way Americans look at our debate on the NSA affair and what has been done from the US side, it is, there are difficulties to understand that what from the US perspective looks at really reaching out to the Germans doesn't have any effect here, while the Germans look at the same dispute and say, or sort of um, affair and, and say, you, you're not giving us what we need some kind of legal agreement or, you know, some kind of huge gesture while the Americans think they've done very much. So here we are. This is the overall context. Um, we have talked a lot during the day about um, perspectives on, uh, on standards, values, um, consumer protection, etc. There is a fascinating uh, poll done by Pew Research, and that is about um, how Germans trust European and US standards. And I'll just give you two figures. When it comes to car safety, which is obviously very dear to the Germans, 91% of Germans say they trust European standards and 4% say they trust American standards. When it comes to environmental safety, uh, the respective numbers are 96% and 2%. So actually that whole discussion of you know, which we had, it's about making toys safe for every child on both sides of the Atlantic. This doesn't go down with consumers because apparently um, they simply do not trust in the levels of protection that you have uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. Obviously, if you look into, you know, tourism traveling over, no one would feel unprotected in an American rented car. But when it comes to actually asking people explicitly about trust, here, um, the data very clearly shows that it's not a slight downfall, but it's a huge difference between what people think Europe can deliver in terms of protection and what US standards can. And that, in my view, uh, explains part of the emotional side of the discussion, which uh, Reinhard Bütikofer has alluded to. Um, of course, not all of this is linked to the NSA affair. Um, it has been reinforced, surely, but there have been other events like the Iraq war, like sort of an increasing, and I guess this happens on the left and right political spectrum, criticism of the American way of life, where I would say in particular in Germany, a debate has surfaced, which has probably been there all the time, but which is now sort of in the mainstream, out there in, a me in the media of a very broad criticism of, of, of the US. And hence, uh, in this situation where many media are actually reporting very critically on singled out elements of TTIP, 
we see less and less policymakers actually taking leadership on the overall issue. So um, it's at the moment not very fancy to be for TTIP in Germany. You would hardly find parliamentarians speaking out loudly if they don't have to. I mean, no one, and Mrs. Merkel did after last weekend summit, which is, which is good, but we don't have the broad strategic debate here. We have a technical debate on certain issues, which partly is very well founded, partly not, but there's no overarching reasoning why we need this. Um, let me make two points on the basic question of this panel, which was in how far TTIP actually uh, is an answer to the challenges of, of globalization. Part of this has been mentioned, so I'll be very short. Sergey, you, you asked about, will, will this allow the West to, to become an imperial regulatory power? Look, my perspective here is that we, that we are actually rather fighting for our place. It's not about imperialism, but it's rather about our um, future capability to protect a certain um, set of values which we should think should not only uh, be dominant in our own economies and societies, but which we as the West like to see as the underpinnings of a global economic and financial order. And the relative economic decline of the West, obviously, I mean, the numbers are so clear. Um, we are in a clear, uh, on a clear downward slope, um, sort of if you take the European and the transatlantic economy together in relative terms. That is not to say that there are no risks in other economic areas. We don't really know how China, Brazil and India will develop over the next years. There may and will be crises, but at the moment, the tendency is that our economic base, our financial weight, and our political influence is clearly shrinking. And this is not only a question of economic figures, you can also see that the BRICS, um, at least some of them, clearly have an appetite to come up with own ideas of creating order according to their norms. And uh, just to give you one example, the BRIC Development Bank, which has just been decided upon, uh, is of course seen as a competitor to European mechanisms because European lending in that field is usually based on conditionality linked to democratic values, for instance, uh, good governance values. Um, this bank will probably not have those values as attached to loans. So that creates a situation where we are suddenly in a do-good competition where the actors, regions, countries we wish to influence by financial aid, helping them to move forward uh, according to ideas we have of good development in terms of good governance and democracy, transparency, anti-corruption fight, etc. Uh, we may be losing out because no one wants our money. Mm -hmm. So we see um, regional arrangements growing, um, alternative tools being created, and hence I think it is high time to think much more constructively uh, in the transatlantic relationship where we want to be in that, in that what I see as a competitive game. That means, as a logical conclusion, that we cannot impose anything on anyone else, but we really have to open up, and this was also said on this panel, we have to come together in what we think we want to stand for, but at the same time be open to precisely those actors, because if we don't have the dialogue, we won't get anywhere. Um, the second point I would like to make with regards to the challenge of globalization is really the internal challenge. And here I'd like to speak about the European Union more than about the US. We are currently facing, facing with um, an economy still in deep crisis, social models that are being deeply questioned, the need to really transform our whole thinking about the future of our economic model and the way we want to provide for social stability in our societies. For that challenge, the TTIP debate comes in a very unlucky way because all of that, what we have been discussing about loss of trust and fears, etc., linked to globalization, transatlantic trade, globalization, investment, and the EU, is really put into one whole debate which is very much about fear and endangerment of what we know as our post-war socio-economic models. And in my view, this all shows in the rise of populists on the left and right-hand side of the political spectrum and the increasing inability of moderate 
parties to come up with a vision. And hence, it is pretty understandable that they are completely helpless when it comes to having a positive and constructive message about TTIP. It all falls into that same debate, and the more we, uh, um, or yes, the, the longer it takes to have a constructive political answer to um, the topics like um, transparency in the TTIP negotiations, uh, protection of consumer rights, etc. The more time this takes, I think the more difficult it will be for the European Union and national governments to actually at all convince publics that this is going to be good for them in any way. So all this is to say that I think um, the way the TTIP debate has developed in Germany is to be taken very seriously. First of all, it's there. It can't be done away with. It can become politically quite impactful in the ratification in the European Parliament, but also in the domestic uh, process, of course. There are serious points here in the discussion which need to be taken into account by the European negotiators, but eventually by both uh, sides um, of the negotiations. And hence, the stakes are so high, because if we don't manage, in my view, to um, bring TTIP to a successful uh, conclusion of the negotiations where people actually see a benefit in what is being done, um, we are undermining the transatlantic relationship and its image. We are undermining the image of the European Union at a time where it needs to reform deeply and get stronger. And last point, we are weakening that, what we need to construct now, as a credible alternative to Russian aggression, and that is the West. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Well, let's assume that what you're saying is, is right and that uh, it's not about uh, dominating, it's about finding a place uh, and, and sustaining in this competition and, and especially you know, defending the values, defending the standards that we think are beneficial and, and right. Um, Tobias Reinhardt from German Watch. Um, do we need trade liberalization in order to achieve these goals? Or are there other instruments? Let's be inventive. Uh, that could bring us to the same uh, to the same result. Yeah, thank you very much. Often, if you are the last speaker in such a panel, it's quite easy because you say, "Oh, most of the things have been said already," and so I just add my few points. This one it's more challenging because I could add a lot to everything that's been said, but in question of time and the question you just raised. I will try to refrain from that to, to a certain extent. Um, to answer your question directly and then maybe make a few additional remarks. Um, the first point, and I think that's been a little bit under the radar of this debate today, is the question whether we need more free trade. The basic outset from which we're debating here in transatlantic relations is, is we have free trade in a very large extent. We have hardly any tariff barriers. We have, even though it wasn't probably very successful in many areas, there is a dialogue of discussing different regulations. So a lot of the things, and that's partly the problem that all those people who write the economic models who are trying to establish what the additional benefits of TTIP are going to be have, Normally, throughout such a model, you start with an outset of saying, oh, you have 30% tariffs on this and 20% tariffs on this, and if you remove these, then we're going to have more production and trade and growth in these areas. We don't have this because besides a few fields in agriculture and maybe trucks, we don't have tariffs. We don't have none of the significant old-style tariff trade barriers that we used to have, also in transatlantic trade 40 years ago, 50 years ago. They are already all gone. So what we are trying to model now is the economic benefits of removing something much more fuzzy. Yeah. Is it going to help trade to remove lead from children's toys? Or how do we, what is, how is it going to impact on trade if we have a more harmonized system to deal with bisphenol A? Yeah. No one knows that. So no one can model it. So we don't really know, to a large extent, which problem we're really going to solve how large the problem is, we're going to be able to resolve with this common sense approach to TTIP. There are a lot of practical problems for companies on both sides of the Atlantic. Those can probably be dealt with. 
But even as we said, and to come back one more time to those models, the EU's own study that it always refers to says in 20 years we have 0.5% GDP growth because of that. So the likelihood, at least what we can get estimate from our current knowledge, our current outset of an already liberalized trade system that we can add to by TTIP is marginal. Uh, you, won't, you will not be able to find that in an impact study 10 or 20 years from now because just the difference it makes is so small compared to all the other changes that are happening in the world. So from that point of view, there, are, there must be other issues, other instruments to deal with global problems and the role the EU and the US play. And coming from an organization that uh, tries to deal with the combination of environment and development issues and social issues and looking at the impact of Germany and Europe on the world. Of course, if you look at the EU and the US, they are still by far the largest economies in the world. If you don't look at purchasing power GDP, but if you look at actual real market price GDP, they're both three, two or three times larger than China still, and it will take <coughs> even China quite a few years to catch up. So the current state of play is the, in the US combined especially are still pretty big, but also the environmental footprint of China, uh, of the <coughs> UN, the US, are still, is still bigger than, than that of China, even though we have roughly a, a bit more than half of the population. So in terms of the global challenges we face, in terms of climate change, in terms of energy and raw material consumption, that's where the EU, EU and the US are still lagging behind in terms of what they would have to do and where they would have to be in a position to set the standards and how we change our economic system on both sides of the, of the Atlantic towards something more sustainable. And I don't see how a common sense TTIP that we just heard would deal with regulations for rear view mirrors of cars and crash tests would make a significant contribution to that. And if you look at what we discussed this morning, the energy chapter of TTIP, which mainly as a request from the EU, which claims to be the world champion in climate change, if their main request is to have easier access to fossil fuels from, from the US, I don't see how this is, how this is a very constructive step to achieve our aim of, ha of having a carbon neutral, carbon free energy system by 2050 or 2060, which is just 30, 40, 50 years away from here. You know? So what we should have as a transnational, trans sorry, transatlantic debate on, on all this is more how we trigger a move away from the current system we have, but rather than having a common sense approach to fixing a, small, a few small problems on the sidelines of dealing with slightly yeah, un unnecessary, unnecessary bureaucratic standards on the, on the sidelines of it. I want to add one more point to uh, what Mr. Hamilton said in his opening remarks in terms of whether a lot of the TTIP uh, criticism is not in, in the EU and especially in Germany more a criticism of uh, Brussels or the EU uh, policies. I think to, to, to a large extent he's right. A lot, of the, a lot of the policies that are criticized there are at least or a lot of the also deregulatory agenda that is perceived to be part of TTIP is not only coming from the US across the Atlantic to attack our European non-negotiable standards. I think I slightly disagree there with Mr. Butik over there. All these standards are, were and are hotly contested inside Europe, inside the European Union. And to agree on something like REACH, we had this in the, in the panel earlier, was a very heavy domestic debate between the chemical industry, between consumers, between environmental protection, with some input from the US. And the fear is that those parts of the political and economic spectrum that didn't want reach in the first place will now at least try to get something like TTIP to strengthen their own allies on the other side of the, of the Atlantic to 
water it down to avoid that something similar happens with nanotechnology or, that, or what the next big regulatory challenge is going to be, rather than that they agree again with, with, with Mr. Bütikofer, rather than starting from the outset saying, in which areas is it necessary to improve our cooperation, not to just fix bureaucratic glitches in regulations, but to really make them more effective in terms of the transformation that we need in our energy and uh, economic system as a whole. I'll stop it there. I have a lot of uh, more things that I would like that's, to add. That's a great, uh, a great keyword, transformation. Uh, uh, energy transformation. Uh, uh, Reinhard, could you re react to this? So, energy security, e energy transformation. What's uh, and then then we will go to Ralph, who is already uh, eager to say something now. Uh, but but first first uh, Reinhard on energy. I'm afraid that as far as I've understood, what's under consideration right now. Uh, just assuming that this would be also um, somehow the result of the negotiations, I would argue it's neither very helpful as regards energy security, nor is it going to help with energy transformation. Uh, as regards energy transformation, I think that's been argued, and I, I don't have to repeat that, but undercutting local procurement rules, undercutting local content rules, undercutting local promotion schemes for renewables or energy efficiency is not helping the transition. That is not on the table because of the U.S. That's on the table because of EU demands, but certainly everybody who wants a transition should oppose that. And the, the second part is, can we have better access to uh, basically uh, LNG uh, from the UN, uh, US based on uh, the, the fracking boom and so on? I think that's, sorry to say, mostly a pipe dream. Because if you look at the figures, Asia is paying a much higher price for LNG that Europe will ever be able to pay and if this would open up, if, the, if, if within the U.S. the internal fistfight between different sectors of the economy, different sectors of industry, would be resolved in favor of those who want to export LNG, which I'm not sure of yet, then it would go to Asia. The U.S. government doesn't own the LNG. It's private companies who own that. They want to make a buck or two. So I don't see this contributing at all to European energy security. I mean, in a very perverse way, even without TTIP, the uh, fracking boom is contributing to European energy security by importing more cheap American coal which is ruining the energy balance of this country. Uh, but that's probably not what we aspire to. I could well imagine TTIP playing a positive role. And I would really sort of be eager to argue that against all the, the people that only have doubts about this. But then the, the both sides have to give me some substance. I would, for instance, be very happy if TTIP would be made a tool in favor of negotiating a common exit from fossil fuel subsidies. In 2009, the G20 has promised to abolish fossil fuel subsidies. Since 2009, the level of subsidies has doubled. To, do, to facilitate an exit unilaterally is always very difficult. Within the WTO, in the agricultural sector, some mutually agreed exit strategies have had some limited successes. We can build, could build on that and make that an integral part of TTIP if there would be a political will. I think that would be a kind of discussion where we might be evoking hope.
Elena, Elena, you have a unique chance of buying one vote in the European Parliament by saying that this, for example, would be something feasible. What about substance? What about, for example, this proposition of cutting uh, or forbidding of, uh, fossil uh, fuel subsidies? You know, I'm going to get another shot at Reinhardt on Thursday. What's going on? What's going to be? On it's a thing I'm in Brussels. Oh. Mm -hmm. Um, can, can I also say one thing? You know, I feel like I'm a little bit in the, in the Stone Age today because I have two Blackberries here and I apologize that you saw me using them, but the, the server that feeds this one is dead. So I'm getting text messages from Brussels, which I'm relaying on the other email to Washington, <laughs> which makes me feel like I have regressed um, substantially. Uh, you know, I don't see a lot of prospect, to be very honest, for using TTIP to agree uh, on fossil fuels. Our Congress has pretty, pretty uh, specific parameters for what we can do in a trade and investment agreement, and that kind of stuff would, uh, would uh, fall into other jurisdictions, I think, including, um, you know, one of the things we're not talking about in TTIP is agricultural subsidies. We're not talking about the cap, and we're not talking about the farm bill, because those are not bilateral issues. Those are multilateral issues, and we need to deal with those in Geneva. So I think the approach on some of the energy issues, too, would be that those are, those are multilateral questions or plurilateral questions that we need to deal with in other, um, in other fora. <laughs> So that was my opportunity. Okay, you didn't want to grab this opportunity. <laughs> uh, we open for interventions, especially but not exclusively, the panelists from other panels, where we want to talk about how these issues inter, uh, interact with each other. Glenn Moody, please. Thank you very much. I was very interested to hear Eleanor talk about the regulatory process and the emphasis on transparency how you want to give companies early access to documents and how you engage them in that process. So my question is very simple, is why can't we extend that courtesy to the public? Um, now, the issue is normally said, well, it's a trade agreement. You can't possibly have this information out in the open because it's all kind of top secret stuff. But WIPO shows that isn't true. WIPO makes all drafts available. It actually streams all of the sessions for everyone to see. So why isn't this happening at TTIP? Because this would win a huge amount of trust from the public. If you don't let the trust, if you don't let the public see what you're doing, there is this sense that you have something to hide. What, what do you mean with streaming? Oh, sorry, streaming, video streaming. They stream all the sessions. In WIPO. Negotiation session? Yes, yes. WIPO. I mean, it's, it's done. I mean, it's how, that's how WIPO works. Why isn't it happening here? You win so much trust from the public. Okay, so here's the thing. This is actually the most transparent agreement that's ever been. Sorry, that's not an answer. No, if you're it, starting from zero, me, that... Please let me finish. Yeah, I will, but, you know. Please let me finish. We have a long record of negotiating these agreements. Um, we have put more information out there on this agreement than we ever have, and the EU has too. Um, at its core, it's a government-to-government -government agreement, and there needs to be a certain amount of space for negotiators to talk to each other. Now, you also heard me talk about how we make regulation in the United States. We do that in a very public process, where everyone has access on an equal basis at the same time to the drafts. We would like that to happen in, in Brussels, and it doesn't. About TTIP, I mean, to say you're doing better, I accept. But if you're starting from zero, 1% is not acceptable. But we're not starting from zero. All right, you're starting from 1%. But compared no, to WIPO, you're doing one, nothing. You know, it's a disgrace. I, I, I disagree, and I will tell you that there is a tremendous amount of information out there, and I'm always... Um, I look for it every day. There are just a few documents. There is not nothing out there. Well... Well, I'm a member of the European Parliament. I'm not a member of the Trade Committee. I'm working on this issue in some other context. I cannot access all the documents, and if I could, I would not be allowed to even take notes. I guess we just leave it like that. Um, so, 
There were more. There were more uh, uh, questions. I saw f someone from the yeah over there. Please uh, introduce yourself, please. Because uh, sorry, you can obviously hear me. I can hear myself. Um, <clears throat> my name is Joshua Curtis. I'm from the Irish Centre for Human Rights, which probably gives away my entire question. Um, but I just wanted to say that. Um, in answer to your question of why there's so much agitation around the TTIP, I think um, there's a sense that uh, amongst ordinary people that if it is a uh, economic NATO, which I think is a quite a popular phrase and you know does have a storytelling value. Amongst a lot of people, the sense is that if there is an enemy, it's actually dumb. It's the little people, it's the small people, it's it's the public in general. That this is something that's going on between states and big business fundamentally, and it's it's the people who might be the ones that will lose out. Uh, which basically leads to um, what I think is the elephant that is not even really in the room, which is basically the idea of human rights. Now you have a, it's on the streets, but I don't think it's yet in the room, but you have the Lisbon Treaty, which has brought about a whole lot of obligations. It's ele elevated the uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights to a quasi-constitutional status within the EU, and it's put obligations on uh, the Commission and other EU bodies to take into account these fundamental rights in all negotiations on policy making, both internally and externally. Um, so you also have the Council of the Euro European Council who has put uh, guidelines down for the Commission to take into account uh, human rights and fundamental rights in, in the course of the negotiations. So the basically, I'm not talking about the public interest here, I just want to make that distinction. I'm not talking about regulating in terms of the public interest, but taking into account um, detailed legal obligations under domestic and international law. The question that I'd ask anybody basically is how is that coming about? How are these obligations under the Lisbon Treaty being implemented in the negotiations here in this context? Uh, so, 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 so basically, you're saying it, it should not be just about the trade negotiations, it should be also about a political uh, uh, um, uh, convergence or human rights convergence between the two? Yeah, well I'm basically saying that all of these issues have human rights implications, whether they're being acknowledged or not is a different issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they do have human rights implications, one of the main ones is the right to work, it's very obvious. Um, and how these are being factored into, so. Oh. Thank you, we're collecting, please. Bernd Hattesur from TEPP, the European Participation Project. Um, ich würde gerne das, was Tobias, Tobias Reichert gesagt hat, noch mal aus einer äh, etwas anderen Perspektive äh, beleuchten und unterstreichen. Ähm, ich war jetzt gerade auf einer dreitägigen Konferenz um, Slow Politics hier in Berlin von Berliner Gazette organisiert mit circa 100 vor allem U40 Menschen, also uh, ein Stück jünger als ich selbst. Uh, uh, ich bin sehr erfreut darüber gewesen, über die Dynamik, uh, die dort herrschte. Und ich würde sagen, wenn man die jetzt uh, gefragt hätte oder die Aussage dieser meist jungen Leute, die sich dort engagieren, als, als Journalisten, die sich zusammenschließen, als Leute in der Ökologie, als Leute, die Menschen, die Demokratie noch mal anders gestalten wollen. Die würden gegenüber dieser ganzen Debat Debatte sagen, da fehlt uns eigentlich das, die, die, die innere Richtung oder das Wesentliche, wo, worauf es uns ankommt. Nämlich das, was vorhin mit Transition bezeichnet wurde. Und zwar Transition, also Veränderung 
der gesellschaftlichen Ausrichtung, unserer westlichen Ausrichtung auch gegenüber den anderen Ländern. Wir, die, diese jungen Menschen, die da zusammengekommen sind, die verstehen sich schon längst als Citizens of the World, also als eine Gemeinschaft, die nicht mehr in nationalen oder in Blöcken denkt, sondern, sondern die gesamtheitlich und ganzheitlich die, die ganze Weltproblematik sozusagen in einen Topf äh, äh, wirft und das gemeinsam und auch unter diesen Aspekten gelöst haben möchte. Also Transition in Democracy, Participation, also wie kann Gesellschaft an den Entscheidungsprozessen beteiligt werden. Das ist ganz, ganz essentiell beispielsweise. Die Ökonomie, wie sind wir ausgerichtet? Gemeinwesenwirtschaft steht da ganz stark im Vordergrund. Das sind Dinge, die, die Ihnen wichtig sind. Und äh, da sind Sie... Da haben sie kein Trust, kein, kein Vertrauen, weder gegenüber dem, was da aufgebaut wird zwischen äh, US-Economy und EU-Economy sozusagen. Sie haben aber auch kein Vertrauen gegenüber dem, was zum Beispiel in Brüssel ausgehandelt wird ohne sie etc. etc. Um, okay, let's, we go in this direction then. Please. Uh, um, Andreas Falk, University of Erlangen, Nuremberg. I'd like to ask uh, Reinhard Butikofer, what makes you so sure that the U.S. will never profitably export liquid natural gas to Europe? I mean, the market is, cha is maybe changing. Never, nobody ever expected that gas prices in the U.S. would be a third of European prices. Fracking is happen probably happening in Asia in China, in Argentina. We may have a totally different market just in a few, uh, few years. And then such an agreement that facilitates uh, the export of LNG may be an opportunity for Europe. We can't really s basically say nothing is going to happen. A lot of things could happen <coughs> where an agreement as such uh, would actually be very beneficial uh, uh, to Europe. Yeah, my question goes to uh, Miss Elena Bryan. Um, you had a very well-prepared speech. Um, I believe that when you're saying um, uh, you're regulating in the public interest and you're not interested in private, privatizing water, um, I also would believe you if you tell me um, you don't want to eat uh, GMO food or you would support GMO labeling, Uh, as much as according to a, a New York um, Times poll now says like about 93% of Umer American citizens would support GMO labeling. Um, but apparently there are corporations that do support this and that are interested in privatizing water and a lot of other things. And um, the fact is that there is no GMO labeling at the moment. So... Um, This we are regulating in the public interest. Um, I'm a bit concerned about how much regulating I, is, uh, how much regulations are really done in the public interest and how much are not. And a uh, little comment to Ms. Daniela Schwarzer. Um, she said something about um, talking about not about strategic points but about technical details. And I think um, this is not sort of appreciating uh, what people here are fearing because it's not technical details, but we are scared about what we might eat in the future. And I think that's more than a technical detail. Thank you. Um, I'm Marie-Sophie Held, assistant to um, the member of the German parliament, Katharina Dröge. And I have a remark. Uh, um, yes, I would like to say, um, I mean, this um, forum is actually called Renegotiate TTIP. So there are a lot of voices that actually ask for renegotiating TTIP or ask for a different TTIP. And this different TTIP, I think, should, um, according to these voices, include um, high standards, environmental standards, uh, low carbon standards, um, energy efficiency standards, high labor standards, etc. And every time um, it's coming to um, the question whether these things are included in TTIP, then I hear the argument that these things should be negotiated in a multilateral area. So I have the feeling that um, 
Yes, you could actually gain a lot of more support for TTIP if you would finally also include um, concrete, um, concrete standards in, in these uh, fields in TTIP and make a commitment here rather than um, always referring to multilateral uh, questions when it comes to these things and uh, bilateral questions when, it's com when it comes to, um, well, just um, trade-related standards. Thank you. Uh, hello, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Rani Dosenbach and I'm from the Sch Schöpflin Foundation. Um, I, I have a question sort of to the uh, uh, speakers generally. Um, <clears throat> I've been wondering about the big picture since this treaty has been in, in the making for a number of years and numerous uh, lobbyists have been really behind it and uh, <clears throat> those lobbyists represent large multinational corporations, not uh, small and medium-sized enterprises or the public or anybody else. So what is really one of their big interests uh, when you just even open a newspaper on a day-to-day -day basic uh, ba basis? Uh, usually they really like avoiding taxes. Um, so I have a question about uh, tariffs that uh, the EU will miss out on regards um, uh, uh, resulting from, from TTIP. Um, I, I'm just I'm just wondering if if we really um, appropriately estimate how interest interested uh, the um, corporate lobbyists are in saving those taxes. It's a, a couple of percent overall still. It's uh, loss of ta tax revenue for for the EU. Um, when you take into account, somebody mentioned this before, but it's in the reports too. Two thirds of um, <clears throat> trade between existing trade between the U.S. and uh, Europe is within large multinational corporations or multinational corporations. When you take, for instance, car manufacturers, uh, uh, a piece of uh, of a car ships back and forth across the Atlantic on average about seven times till it's in its final form. Uh, they pay uh, t uh, tariffs on this each time. Um, I think the, the estimate in the car manufacturing sector is that it's between 5 and 7% of, of, of tariffs that still exist. Um, so <clears throat> I, I, I came across this question when I looked at a survey by uh, the Rheinland-Pfalz and Saarland uh, Deutsche Industrie and Handelskammer, uh, where SM, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises were asked how, many, uh, <clears throat> how, how much they really care about the, the benefits of TTIP and they said they care as much about tariffs as about uh, reduction of tariffs as about reduction of non-tariff barriers. Um, so, uh, so I'm wondering if this is not just also, to some extent, a little bit of fog that the corporate lobbyists are creating to not have people pay attention to basically uh, another uh, tax breaks, another tax break that you're also giving simultaneously to multinational uh, corporations. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, we have one, two, three, four questions, and then uh, we'll take Nick, and we have to finish, because otherwise we're gonna spend, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I have to. I just counted who are on the uh, list of speakers, and then we'll have to finish, otherwise we would need some beds here to spend the night. Um, so, uh, and we don't have them here, Hindi. Uh, please, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I've, uh, please. Hello, Klaus Lönert here, einfach als Bürger. Es scheint mir, die Diskussion ist mit zu vielen verschiedenen Themen überladen. Es wäre vielleicht hilfreich, wenn man sich einfach auf die Themen beschränken würde, für die die erst mal, über die man gleichen Standpunkt hat und dann in einem zweiten Schritt vielleicht über die Themen spricht, wo man sich eben noch vielleicht streiten muss um auf einen gemeinsamen Punkt zu kommen. Sie meinen unsere Diskussion oder nee, die Verhandlungen? Die, die Verhandlungen. Die Verhandlungen sind überladen. Ja gut, ich weiß eben nicht, ob das jetzt unsere Diskussion ist oder was in den Verhandlungen drin ist, weil ich, ich kenne die Dokumente nicht. Okay, gut. Aber wir können Ihnen sagen, wo Sie zu finden sind, aber auch wir kennen nicht alle Dokumente. Aber äh, das ist ein guter äh, Hinweis. Wir äh, nehmen das auf. Ähm, Ja, wir, wir gehen einfach durch. Das jetzt sind Thanks. Uh, Helga Springener, um, Federation of German Consumer Organizations. I've got two particular questions. Uh, the first one to Mrs. Uh, Brian. 
Uh, I know that TTIP itself uh, won't liberalize or privatize, uh, for example, water supply. Uh, but, you, uh, but as you earlier mentioned, that, for instance, uh, U.S. local governments are in charge for water supply. So would you agree on a change in negotiations from a, positive, uh, from a negative list approach to a positive list approach? So why not? <laughs> you already gave uh, the answer. And my second question is to Mrs. Rostowska. As far as I know, there is a bilateral investment agreement between Poland and the U.S. since uh, 2004. Uh, do you know or do you have any figures uh, how the U.S. Uh, direct investment uh, developed since then? Thank mm you. -hmm. Uh, Um, yeah, just if, if I may, a quick comment. <clears throat> I happen to be one of those big bad corporate lobbyists. I also happen to, to be a former U.S. diplomat and worked for you know, 20 years trying to improve and enhance the U.S. and European relationship because I saw that it did gr good in the world. And one of the areas where it did good are things like in Ukraine and our joint response to then the Orange Revolution. There was a question about human rights and then the comment about a major human right is a right to a job. And I think that in this discussion that we have as we're looking at TTIP, we need to take the advice that you just gave into account. As, as Elena was saying, when our leaders, when President Obama and not just Presidents von Rompuy and Barroso, but also the presidents of all of the member states decided to launch these negotiations. They did so for one reason. They did so to make changes relative to our trading relationship because they believed, whatever you think about the studies, they believed that it would create growth and create jobs. And it's interesting to me because I, like Elena, have traveled around most of the member states if you go to an Italy or a Spain or a Lisbon, or for that matter, a Poland, you get a very different narrative about TTIP because people are focused on the human rights of creating jobs and they see potential for themselves. And I think it's important that we bear this in mind. There's the, to me, one of the things that is important in this is that the United States and Europe can and should, the United States and European Union can and should be doing many things with each other. We do work together to promote human rights. We do work together to promote democracy. We do work together to promote development. All of these things are good parts of our relationship. TTIP is not an economic NATO, but what it does is it does strengthen if it's done properly, it will strengthen the US-EU relationship. It will strengthen the ability of the United States and Europe to work together on a host of other issues that are on beyond the trade one. And I think that that in and of itself is part of its strategic value. Yeah, I was involved in the multilateral agreement on investment the last time People tried to do this, and it failed. Um, you can blame the French. You can blame several things. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce was part of the failure. But it, the, the, the headline in the FT was called Internet Guerrillas. They said this was the first time campaigners have used the Internet to campaign globally, which wasn't actually true, but it was a great little headline. But it went down as the first social media age global campaign on a global agreement. So, And it proved one thing, which I think is true, despite the hyperbole. You can't sell a false premise in a social media age. And from this conversation, I really get the idea that we don't... There's several different reasons, things that we're trying to sell for several different reasons. I don't know which one is true. I'm not sure anybody here knows which one is true because the bosses are up there, not in the room. Um, but it's just the fact that creates distrust and you can't deal with that. And the second point is it's about priorities. You know, Cameron says this is a top priority for the Commission. Not a priority, the top priority... So if we really have a common sense TTIP or a TTIP light, there's going to be some very disappointed leaders in Europe. 
and we should talk to them about they shouldn't be making it their top priority for the Commission. I think a climate change agreement is the top priority next year. I want to have that debate because at the moment we're not having it. So priorities. If, on the other hand, it's not common sense TTIP, it's TTIP light or TTIP light, it's a significant market asset access. We dig into some of the 140 pages of exceptions to the MAI, the Americans tabled. UK tabled four pages. One was on fisheries. Very emotive, the pages you tend... Well, you're, the Americans on pool halls in Philadelphia where you have investment restrictions on foreign ownership. Don't ask me. It's probably gone now. Um, then if we actually do that, it will impact on trust in the EU. We talked about that. So that mismatch. And the last one, if it's really about geopolitics, as EU negotiators said to me personally, as well as in the press, this isn't a kind of, you know, inference, then let's have a discussion about it. But what worries me is you've got, those, you've got three different sets of motivations and no clarity. And in a world where trust me does not work, and again, being very parochial, this is about the EU, I really worry we're going to bust confidence in the EU over this issue unnecessarily for no massive benefit. So I, it just, I just think without any of discussion, I don't take any sides, the political process around TTIP is massively broken. I saw this on the MAI. The negotiators kept on denying it, kept on being honest, giving us the don't worry, it'll be all right story, which I know negotiators have to. But they actually should have told their masters, you need to sell a different story because this one is not working. And for everybody, I don't think it's anybody's interest on either side of the debate, actually, to run that political debate. So I really think one of the great things from this conference, because we actually got rid of some of the rhetoric, was to say, at the heart of this, there is a real political problem which needs to be solved and cannot be glossed over. And it's, you know, I don't, I'm not blaming on anybody, I'm just saying there is a political problem which could come back and bite us in a really vicious way next year because it's not an option next year. We really have to get some stuff done. Thank you. Thank you. We, we come back to the panel. Wait, wait, wait a second. I, I already said there are no... We, we've already closed the, closed the list. <laughs> we, come, we come back to the, uh, uh, on, on the panel, uh, and we will try to answer the questions. And true, moment. Moment. Okay, alles klar, das nehmen wir auch mit, uh, können vielleicht auch reagieren auf dem Podium. Um, so, we, we uh, uh, go back to the panel, and I would suggest that we go from left to right, I'm sorry. You know, sure. no? uh, and uh, Tobias, if you could uh, react to some of the uh, uh, inputs here. Uh, yes. I'd like to react to one point where TTIP is, is seen as a potential to make sure that our Western standards, whatever that may be, but I do agree that there's probably more commonalities in some approaches between the EU and the US as opposed to other parts of the world, um, how this could be a beneficial impact of, uh, of TTIP. And um, coming back to what, to what we said before, it's also there, it's probably not enough to have the common sense approach to say how, to, how do we streamline our bureaucratic uh, procedures. I just heard from a German, not negotiator, but the German person in the Ministry of Economic Affairs who deals with TTIP, that now for the first time, looking at TTIP, the Germans and the, the Europeans and the Americans discuss how their crash tests are actually done after 20 years of economic and regulatory cooperation. Uh, so there seems to be an issue with that. But is that going to set a standard that the rest of the world would like to adhere to? Or isn't it, if you look at China, which is obviously the elephant that everyone's scared of, that their standards might then rule the world. The Germans, German dairy industry, has a huge export boom in, in the last few years which is entirely for the reason that Chinese dairy companies started poisoning their customers by adding melanin to, to their dairy products. So in China, from consumers and to some extent from the government, there's a demand for better regulations, and not on the level of how do we streamline it, how do we make it less bureaucratic, but how do we effectively enforce higher and better standards, 
And precisely, this is a debate I'd like to have in a transatlantic cooperation setting. And if we have this under the framework of how do we reduce barriers to trade, it's a bit complicated. One final remark also what probably leads to the suspicion of the German and by extent some other public in, in some European countries, a lot of the high-level disputes in the WTO on controversial issues, starting with hormone beef, continuing with GMOs and, and chlorinated chicken, were between the EU and the US. So this is, we need a very different approach to this in TTIP if we're really A, going to build trust, and B, going to set a precedent on how to better enhance on the consumer side and also on, on the, as, a, as I mentioned earlier, energy side, to, to set this type of Western values. The, both the common sense approach and, of course, even less so the Christmas tree uh, approach for corporate lobbyists is not going to do that trick. And as Mr. Butikov has said, there's no indication so far in the current TT process, at least not in the official part, and it would be not very smart in terms of communication to keep that part secret, uh, that indicates that this is a debate that's actually going on. I obviously realize that given both the political situation in the US Congress especially, and also <laughs> at least to some extent what the European Commission had as their main objective of the, of the political agenda, which is to a large part deregulation. Mr. Mr. Timmermans, the prime uh, deputy of Mr. Juncker, his original or his main uh, idea, uh, his, his main task is to improve and reduce regulations. If this deregulatory agenda prevails, then the level of trust that's needed and the level of uh, good examples for a better Western approach to standards, again, whatever that may be, is probably not going to be achievable. So we need an entirely new approach to TTIP that goes well beyond just limiting it, limiting it to common sense. Thank you, Maya. There were a couple of questions pointed uh, uh, to you, and I, I, one of them on bilateral uh, investment agreement. I talked to someone in the Czech foreign ministry uh, just recently, and I asked them about their uh, in, uh, uh, experience with the bilateral investment treaties, and he said it's it's horrible, and and I said um, so you are probably against TTIP, and he said no, that's why we are for TTIP, we want to replace our bilateral investment treaties. Is it the same? Yeah, it's exactly the same situation, parents. So thank you for bringing it up because it's a very interesting um, topic. ISDS in Poland and these other nine countries that have currently these bilateral investment treaties with the US. I actually recently wrote a paper about it, and this is why I was scrolling through my phone quite rudely. I was trying to get the data for you, which you asked about. Um, the, IS, the, the bilateral investment treaty that Poland has with the US actually dates back to 1990, which is why it's as bad as it is. It's because we were a transitioning country at the time, and we just sort of accepted these um, the, the the conditions that were that were given. Um, there have been nine cases against Poland by the U.S. since it's been in place. That makes Poland Poland basically ranks seventh in the world in terms of how many um, cases are brought by U.S. investors. Um, by no means, not all of those resulted in payouts. I couldn't find the data. I think it's about two out of those nine. Um, so Poland, as you said, like the Czech Republic, wants ISDS to be part of TTIP, um, and that's because we want, well, the Polish government wants more precise safeguard clauses, because right now they're completely detrimental. One thing they want is a closed list of situations that signify breaking of the fair and equitable treatment clause. Another thing is we're car the P Poland is currently financially responsible for legislation that's passed at a EU level. So if an American investor doesn't like legislation in Poland that was made in Brussels, that's Poland is still financially responsible for that. So that's one of the things. So that's, once again, completely different tellings of the story. Yeah. Helena, there were a number of questions. You don't have to answer all of them, but maybe you could try at least to address some. Okay. 
So, you know, um, one of the nice things about living in a democracy is everybody's entitled to their view. Um, you gave me, you know, you, you challenged me about how much regulation is being done in the public interest. You might have one definition of the public interest and somebody else might have another one. Um, that's what elected officials are for. But the fact that you live in a place, I'm sorry, I don't mean to lecture, where, where you can have a view and you can share your view and you can try to convince other people of your view is important. One of the things I've noticed in TTIP as I've been wandering around is that, you know, views on particular issues in Germany may not be shared in other member states. Uh, different member states have different views, but there's a discussion going on. And there seems to be, um, TTIP, I think, in Europe has gotten conflated with a whole bunch of domestic discussions. In the U.S., we're also having domestic discussions about a number of issues. One of them is GMO labeling. Um, you know, some states want to do it. There's a discussion in the federal government. But it's a discussion we're having, and the Congress is probably going to get involved. And the Congress is going to have to decide what's the right what's the right answer for the United States. You know, and in our system, uh, you know, congressmen are reelected every two years. If your constituents are unhappy with you, you probably find yourself without a job. That's pretty powerful. Um, you know, somebody, somebody made a comment about, you know, this is only big business lobbyists. Well, I beg to differ. Um, just because you're a business doesn't mean you're, a, you're only a, sorry, just because you're a lobbyist doesn't mean you're a big business. NGOs lobby. You know, I'm more or less a lobbyist in Brussels because I'm advocating with the commission. Um, but I think, yeah, Reinhardt agrees. But you know, I, I think um, I think lobbyist has taken on an unfortunate um, image because basically what people are doing is advocating for their positions, whether that's a company position, whether that's an industry, whether it's someone who who's focused on human rights or consumer protection, and we need all those voices in our in our economies. Um, we value, we value them in the United States. I lived in Washington for a long time, and I'll tell you, we heard from everybody. Um, you know, we did, a, a, we did a public outreach, which we, we always do, when we were um, considering starting TTIP, and we got 350 responses. Someone said, well, that's not so many. Well, it's actually a lot, and some of them were representative of small businesses, some of them were environmental, labor, you name it, we got it. We're engaging with people all the time because it's important to hear what the views are. Um, you know, at the end of the day, people above me are going to have to figure out where we end up. Just as at the end of the day, on this side of the water, um, the appropriate officials are going to have to decide what Europe wants to do. I mean, if this was um, it's, I think the situation's more complicated here because you have 28 sovereign countries who are trying to get Brussels to do it the way they want it. But at the end of the day, you 28 have to sit in Brussels and decide how you can come to agreement among you, yourselves and then work on Reinhard. I mean, we have your interest, but, but that's the democratic process. We have one, you have one, you constructed it, we constructed ours. Um, and I would have to say, listening to the discussion here all day, it seems to be working. Um, uh, you know, I think, um, I think it's pretty hard to have one priority. I have never seen a president who can say, my only priority or my top priority is because um, we are big, diverse economies with a lot of interests. And I mean, I was looking at Mr. Juncker's 10 points. Mm -hmm. And I know if he had, you know, 
number one might work for Germany and somebody else would say, oh, no, 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 I care more about this, or, you know, coming from the UK. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think it's a, um, I think, as you all know, it's a, it's a balancing act at, for the politicians at the, at the end of the day. They have a lot of uh, constituents, they have a lot of interests, um, and they all want to be successful because no, no politician wants to be a failure. But, but I think also they want their societies to succeed and they want people to, people to be able to work. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the prospect of having a lost generation for societies is really, is really bad when you have um, that many people in a young cohort who can't find jobs. And I know um, that's something our president thinks about. And my sense is that's pretty much on the, the minds of the leaders on this side of the water, too. Thanks. Thank you uh, very much, Elena. And thanks for being here, uh, despite your other obligations, as everyone at this panel. Reinhard, um, um, you're not getting what you asked for. You're not getting <laughs> cut on fossil uh, subsidies for uh, uh, fossil fuels, you're not probably not getting many other things. Uh, do you still think that this is worth arguing for a better TTIP, or is the uh, process, as Nick said, fundamentally broken? Uh, can we still get uh, um, something like someone mentioned here, a, par a, a paradigm change, transformational TTIP? Do you still believe in this? And do you still believe that, or do you agree that a failure in TTIP negotiations might, might also be a signal strategically and security-wise to Russians and to Chinese that the West does not work anymore? Look, I am not one of those who knew that TTIP had to be a failure under any circumstance before the negotiation even started. Uh, I have argued that there are some red lines that cannot be crossed, but I've been willing to engage in the conversation. And uh, that, however, does not imply that I am willing to be dragged behind an agenda that I can't possibly subscribe to. And I, I spoke to a US trade negotiator in May 2013, even before the negotiation started, and we spoke about the geopolitical dimension of this upcoming TTIP negotiation. And we both agreed that there could be some merit in aligning US and EU to defend some, let's say, labor standards, even though we believe that our labor standards are much better than the US and the uh, International Labor Organization tends to agree with us. But it would be helpful to defend some such labor standards together, for instance. And then my question was, look, if this is what convince the president to allow Mike Froman to start negotiating this geostrategic relevancy. <laughs> Do you believe that we should allow sectoral interests like represented by those who have been pushing GMO forever to take this whole endeavor hostage to their sectoral interests? And the person said, of course not, we're not stupid. I said, well, that sounds good, uh, but this is just one side of the coin. And the other side that many people see is this. There are lobbyists, I'm not talking you, about you, Peter, there, and, and I would agree with Elena that lobbyists is not in itself a bad name, um, but there are lobbyists that are saying we have to put GMO into the deal. And now people have seen more than once 
that powerful economic interests from big corporations have managed to sway politicians. That's, that wouldn't be a novel thing. So they're suspicious. They want to have guarantees. And then you see the chief scientists of the EU saying that we're stupid because we're legislating against GMO. Oh, that adds to the suspicion. And then, of course, at one point, you have to make up your mind. And people are fighting so very hard for one very practical reason. If we allow GMO to remain on the table till the very end, then we will be confronted with a situation that's very easily to, uh, to imagine. We're going to be told, look, now we negotiated for so many years such a perfect deal, and it's going to help growth and jobs and whatever, and the good in the world, and we'll beat back uh, Chinese aggression, whatever the argument would be. Would you dare risking that just because your narrow little GMO interest has not been satisfied? That's what I foresee, and that's what a lot of people foresee. So they want to make sure if this goes to the line, some of the most contentious issues have been drawn from the table before that. And I think that's very much of a real politique kind of approach if you defend those interests. And there are American trade negotiators who are saying privately, we will never pursue the goal of having mutual recognition between REACH and Tosca. But publicly, it's not been said. Publicly, it's not been said. And that creates, again, suspicion. There are American trade negotiators that privately say, we will not buy this funny idea from De Hucht about the Regulatory Cooperation Council. But publicly, it's not been said. It creates suspicion. And then you see that Mr. Juncker makes a very convincing argument about ISDS. He says, ISDS is not going to be sold to the European public. So let's go down a different route. And he has announced in the European Parliament that he will not countenance a result by which European courts would be undercut in their role, which would imply that there could possibly be ISDS, but only after the courts have had their say, which is completely different from what is on the table now. He's been warned by 14 member states' governments, including Germany, not to say that in the European Parliament. He still did say it. Why wouldn't you want to put pressure on all the actors if you don't think that ISDS is a good solution? Why wouldn't you put pressure on them if you see all of that happening? And if negotiators want to create trust and want to sort of win people over, they have to give. They have to satisfy the interests that are being argued. And quite frankly, if there is value to the geopolitical dimension, and as I have said before, I think there is some value to that, even though we should then engage in a more in-depth discussion of what kind of geopolitical approach we want to pursue, but there is some value to that, then we cannot let, let that fall victim to narrow interests that I have just attacked. Second point on LNG, uh, I'm a very bad prophet, so it could be true that situation will change. I don't count on that. I don't count on frack much fracking in China because they don't have the water where they would need it. I don't count on much, uh, a, a very long fracking um, um, fracking success in the U.S., I think it's a bubble, it will burst. But even if I'm not right, the contribution that could be made 
will not help us in the next one, two, three, four, five years. And that's the relevant issue. If the US would open their next LNG terminals that they would need to export the LNG, there's no terminal that's going to be open before the end of 2015. And even then, all the contracts that have been uh, negotiated are selling that LNG to Asia. So maybe we could get some LNG to Europe by 2017 or 2018. I don't know. I wouldn't exclude that. But certainly, that's not helping us in the necessary transition right now to sort of move away from our uh, Russian dependency. So I'm not saying it will never, ever help in any count. I'm just saying don't oversell it. And the, the last point is about the jobs. Uh, Senator Moynihan famously said, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own facts. And with regard to jobs, this rule is flouted uh, terribly. The EU Commission has put out uh, information that every European family would benefit 545 euro per annum because of TTIP. This is just, I don't know, this is uh, superstition. This is perfect superstition. Nobody knows any such figures. Not 400, uh, 544, not 546, 545. Uh, and Peter, you know exactly that you're overselling the jobs argument. We've had this discussion earlier. The predictions about what that will add to growth, if at all, are not that bright. And if you then look to what Public Citizen has calculated about the downsides, possible downsides of such a deal, you're overselling the argument. And this is something that is also putting people off. If they believe they're being, being dealt with like dummies who you can sell some cheap propaganda, they will certainly not buy your argument. So I think some of the best enemies of TTIP are some of those who say that they are the promoters. This was the uh, last word in this conference on the substance. Thank you very much to everyone, because my words are going to be the last ones on technical issues. Uh, thank you so much for coming here, for bearing with us, for bearing with tough questions <coughs> and uh, giving a fight. Um, Thank you to core uh, sponsors, to Dan Hamilton, who's probably up in the sky now on the plane heading back to Washington. Uh, thank you to the great technical team who uh, uh, made everything possible here. To the translators, danke sehr für unsere Dolmetscherin. Danke für die wunderbare Sabine Hemmerling, die sitzt irgendwo uh, in der Ecke, die die ganze Konferenz uh, gemeinsam uh, praktisch zu zweit, zu dritt mit uns geschmissen hat. Und uh, uh, Claudia Rote, die war ja auch da, die musste jetzt leider gehen. Herzlichen Dank an alle, das war ein sehr guter Austausch und hoffentlich setzen wir es fort, vielleicht mit anderen Formaten. Danke und guten Abend.